All right. Hi. Uh, I'm Allison Horsley. I'm doing the Chekhov and Me talk today. Uh, I brought some notes, but it feels kind of strange doing that in such an informal space. Uh, anyway, so I'm a, I'm a dramaturg and I'm a translator. And um, what I do is, is literal translation, even though there's kind of no way to really define that. But, uh, but Raphael and the folks at, at Soho Rep asked me to come and kind of talk about what my relationship is with Chekhov. Uh, I've been working on Chekhov plays now for about eight years. Um, I have kind of a strange relationship with Chekhov and the work, mostly because I came at it, I first became interested in Russian stuff because of Rasputin, oddly enough. And I think maybe because of the irony and all that, that, that sort of the, the least successful murder in, in the history of Russia is kind of also the most famous one. And I think I should have known then that my relationship with Russian was going to involve a lot of irony and humor at the time. Uh, but I didn't really know that yet. And uh, I went to college and I ended up learning Russian because I had to learn some foreign language. And I was fascinated by it. And I thought it was incredibly difficult and fascinating and scientific and mathematical and profoundly frustrating in like the best possible way. So I kind of held on to Russian in this way that I, uh, that I just refused to let go of. Uh, and so it was a bit later uh, that once I had abandoned all hope of, of doing something actually in Russian, but more doing it in theater and dramaturgy and stuff like that, that Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh, approached me about doing a literal translation of The Cherry Orchard because they wanted someone to be able to do an adaptation of it, and they wanted as close of a roadmap to the original Russian as humanly possible. Uh, and so they, they approached me about doing the literal translation because I knew them, I'd intern for them. And uh, I immediately, being the same person that I am, moderately sane, I tried to talk them out of it. And I said, no, you need a native Russian speaker if you're going to have someone translate Chekhov. That's ridiculous. It really can't be an American who's doing it. You need a native speaker, and I'll find you one, because I'm from Texas. I'm not a native Russian speaker, clearly. And they said, well, we want a theater person, um, because anyone can, can deal with the Russian part, but we want someone who can look at the language and really give Libby, the woman that I was being hired uh, to translate for, to give Libby a real sense of what the language is and to get inside of it kind of with her and do this process with her. And so I thought, OK, that's, that's pretty close to what I do. So sure, I'll, I'll try that. And so, uh, so I started doing literal translations of Chekhov plays for Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And I was commissioned in 2004. We did our first one, which was Cherry Orchard. And then we did Seagull, and then Vanya, and Three Sisters. And now I'm in the middle of Ivanov. And at this point, it's kind of either it or me. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to tackle it, but it's kind of a beast. So, uh, so I have this rolling commission for Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And um, so normally it takes me, the first translation I did took me about nine months. Cherry Orchard took me about nine months to get through. And, uh, and literally what I do is I get a Russian version of the play. I try to find a version of it that I know for sure is uh, as close to whatever the original would have been. Because when I first started doing it, I was a little worried that the Soviets, that because I, I, I have no formal training in Chekhov. I have a lot of training in linguistics and the really nerdy stuff but no training when it comes to literature and stuff like that, which in a weird way, when trying to get inside of this, allows me as much objectivity as a normal person might have when they're looking at Chekhov, as opposed to having the kind of bias that somebody might have if they were a writer who was madly in love with Chekhov or whatever. Instead, for me, it's, it's an entirely foreign thing that I kind of look at and try and understand and, and grab onto and hold onto in the same way that I did when I first started learning the language. So for me, it's a little more scientific or linguistic in addition to the artistic stuff, but it's more of a puzzle and a challenge to try and understand it. And then the artistic part comes in to try to communicate what it is that I see in the language to this other person. Um, so I, I go through uh, a, an original Russian version. I use a, a large Soviet collection that was published in the 80s. Um, that apparently is very accurate uh, to, to the original. Um, I use that and basically I go through and I translate it uh, using a lot of brackets and notes and having a continual conversation with the person that I'm creating the translation for the entire time. So my translations are not the type of thing that you, that you saw today. It's much more of a, well, the word is kind of like this, but it's kind of like that, but it's kind of like that. And um, he used this in one of the other plays, and here's how he used it in that other play. So I try and remove 
everything I can of myself from the final decision that's going to be made regarding the poetry of the actual language, but try to give the woman that I'm working with, who in this case is Libby Apple, and, and Annie Baker also worked off of a literal translation with this. So what I did is probably most similar to what uh, a, young, a, a woman named Marie and I, I didn't, I, I don't know her, but uh, who did the literal translation. So probably what she gave Annie Baker is something similar to what I give to Libby, which is as close of a, of a clue to the original language and the original play that you can possibly get without making some of the final artistic decisions. So in terms of the types of decisions that are made, it's the kind of thing like in this play, how do you deal with all the Russian things? There are kopecks, there are versts, there are things like that. There's the scene where uh, between Yelena and Sonia where they're talking about calling each other ty, which in Russian is a specific thing. It's, a f it's the informal you versus the formal you. So how the heck do you translate that when there's no way to translate it in, in English? So what I do is I try to give the best sense of it that I can and say, well, you know, in Russian, there's actually a phrase for let's switch to T, which is like, we're going to be less formal with each other and be more friendly, so we'll, we'll do that. So I try and communicate it in that way. Um, and sometimes it's incredibly impactful to an audience's final understanding of what the play is, and other times it's, it's smaller things. Um, so the best example that I can really give of, of the type of way that the scientific way that I look at translation helps is probably not necessarily with Uncle Vanya, but in the case of Seagull. Do you guys know Seagull? All right. Um, at the end of Seagull, so there are two words for to shoot oneself that are used in Seagull. There's the imperfective and the perfective. Russian has imperfective verbs, uh, which are things uh, in process that aren't necessarily completed, and there are things which uh, are perfective, which are completed verbs. It's the difference between, I was reading Moby Dick, like, I was reading it at one point, I didn't necessarily finish it, versus I read Moby Dick, right? Cover to cover, it was awesome. Uh, in Russian, that phenomenon happens often with a prefix uh, that comes before a verb. So in the middle of Seagull, for example, um, Arkadina, the mother, says, and here I'm leaving, I still don't know why Constantine shot himself. The word that she uses for Constantine, for Triplyov, her son, the artist at the center of it, uh, shooting himself is a reflexive and imperfective word. So he shot himself, he didn't really finish the job, right? He didn't shoot himself to completion, he just sort of did that in the middle of the play. Um, the final verb in the play is the perfective form of to shoot oneself. And in fact, there's something about the prefix in that word that implies very complete, like over complete, kind of overdid it. And so it's funny because in a production where you're talking about Seagull and you're talking about whether the play is a comedy or a tragedy or whatever, and for some folks who don't necessarily have access to the Russian, they say maybe it's a comedy because maybe at the end he shot himself a second time and he didn't really complete it. You know, maybe he failed again. And to that I would say that's a fantastic point, but Chekhov didn't really write that. Actually, what Chekhov wrote was that he did it to completion. It's in the word. It's like with German words that are incredibly long and they have the meanings of like 20 different things inside of them. That's kind of how Russian is, where it tells you everything you need to know within that word. And to a native Russian speaker, they may not necessarily hear all of it because they know the meaning of the word because they grew up with it, but to a foreign, to a foreign ear like, like mine or, or maybe one of yours, the word seems stranger to our ear and therefore you pay more attention to it and therefore you get inside of it in a different way. And so a lot of my job is trying to pay attention to the stuff that looks kind of funny in the Chekhov that maybe to a native speaker might seem kind of normal or might sound like everyday speech, but to me, I notice the things that are particularly strange because I'm even more removed from it uh, because I'm not a native speaker. So in a funny way, I found that that gives me a kind of nice certainly not an advantage over native speakers, but it's a different way that I approach, the, that I approach what I do. Um, and in terms of trying to describe my experience of translating for somebody else, um, what we experience today with sort of sitting on the same level as the playing space and kind of overhearing this living room conversation is about as close to what happens in my head when I'm working on a translation as I can really describe. I've never thought about it before other than, than just to think that when I'm reading the original Russian 
and trying to figure out a way to communicate it to the woman that I'm working with who does the adaptations, it's like sitting here in this room with my feet dangling off of something and just sort of watching and then saying, oh, in this part they're talking about that. You know, and then sort of continuing to listen. Oh my God, I can't believe he just said that that way. That was fierce. You know, and then continuing to watch and giving a kind of rolling commentary. And that's kind of my job, is not necessarily to like redo what's happened in front of me, but it's to try and communicate what it is that I'm seeing in front of me for an audience of people who are alive today. So, and actually, um, and we're doing them very much for modern audiences today. So actually, I'm, I'm really excited to see what Annie Baker's done, because it's, it's very similar, actually, to the versions of Chekhov that we've been doing out in Oregon. So it's cool that it's being heard, uh, heard I think, in, in this wonderful way. And in terms of why I love Chekhov, I love Chekhov that it's, it's devastating, and the highs are devastating, and the lows are devastating, and the plateaus that are kind of boring are devastating in their profound truth, right? It's kind of, it's heart-wrenching. Um, and there's something about it that's so pedestrian and at the same time so beautiful in its simplicity. It, it reaches the sublime, like in that last moment that we saw, just with the lights going down. It's this kind of utter truth that's so incredible. Um, and another moment that struck me in this production too is that pretty much whenever someone is having an honest emotional experience on stage in Chekhov, often they're immediately cut off by someone uh, coming in who's kind of the worst nightmare version of what they were just talking about. So in the moment that Sonia's talking about not being very pretty, guess who comes in the door? Pretty, right? Immediately. Um, and this happens throughout. So if you notice in Chekhov's plays, uh, every time somebody says something like, oh God, everything would be fine if I just don't have to see him again, footstep, 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 right? Of course, it's going to be him coming in. You know, oh, it would be fine if they just don't ask me for money anymore. Next scene. Can I have some money? Well, it'd be really good if we can have a little more money for this person. So it's this kind of amazing constant undercutting that just when someone starts peeking from their heart, it's when someone interrupts with a pedestrian interjection that cuts them off utterly. Uh, so right when you're professing your love, it's when another character asks where the bathroom is, right? It's right when you need your dignity the most that you fall down the stairs. So that constantly happens, and it's one of those things that, um, that even, as I, even as I've continued translating, I'm, I continue to be surprised and kind of um, flabbergasted by how cruel it, it is and how brilliant and, and comic. So, um, so that's a little bit of, of why I like Chekhov and the irony of it. It's just the undercutting of dignity constantly. And you see it so much more in the Russian and there are so many translations where we don't get to see it as much. And in this one, you see it. You see the humor and you see the devastation and the fierceness of language combined with the pedestrian kind of boring blah of everyday life. And then all of a sudden, you know, that's horrible and it cuts you out of it. And that's what, I think that's what I love about Chekhov and that's why I keep kind of holding on to it. So that's, um, that's a little bit of a spiel about what I do and I don't know, my thing with Chekhov, Chekhov and me, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm happy to chat a little bit afterward, but I know they have to probably get the space ready for another show tonight and vacuum the seating or something. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Keep seeing Chekhov. Yeah,